What's up everyone, welcome to Akuma Studies and today we are discussing about dis discussing about we're discussing how the Swiss came to dominate luxury watch manufacturing. So first off the bat, you're gonna hear a lot of the god looks speaking out through the door, so there's nothing I can do about it. Let's get started. The Swiss switch watch uh, industry, right? We hear so much about it, we admire so many companies that come from it. Um, but yet we don't really know, I mean I don't until I researched, I mean I didn't know how the Swiss came to dominate uh, the watch industry so heavily. And it started very, very, very early, the foundations. And it was started by the French Wars of Religion that occurred in the 18, 1980s. So these, these French Wars of Religion were caused by Martin Luther, Martin Luther's objections with the Catholic Church. So if you're not familiar with that, Martin Luther basically led um, sort of like a, I'd say, a religious disagreement with the Catholic Church. I believe the Catholic Church was saying basically that if you paid for uh, works of art, uh, not works of art, sorry, works that the church was making, whether it was a cathedral or something, you donated money, you could be as absolved for your sins. Martin Luther had a problem with that because to him that meant that if you ha you could wash away your sins with money, and to him that was just very, very, very um, unchristian like. So he nailed his um, disagreements with the Catholic Church in a church, I think he was in Germany, and it caused huge unrest. And there was major, major, major wars that happened after this um, Catholics versus Protestants. And um, if, if you ever wondered why, uh, how the Catholics split up, how, you know. There's a, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, Christianity, but it, this is a very interesting part to look at. So many people from France who are, I believe, I can't remember if they're, I think they were Protestant, I think they were Protestant, fled from France to Switzerland and uh, setting up the foundation of watchmaking. There was, these were skilled um, immigrants, these were not, these were, I mean, picking up and moving in medieval times was not a very easy thing to do, but these people were craftsmen, they were jewelers, um, some were, had watchmaking ex experience, and um, this combined with the, with the Reformation of, with the Reformation movements going on in Geneva, it created a ruthless combination. So, uh, what I mean by that, so John Calvin, um, I can't, I, honestly, I, when I read about this, him, I didn't look him up too much. I've never heard of John Calvin. But what it seems is that uh, he was very, very inspired by Enlightenment ideas and incorporated that into Geneva. I feel like he was maybe a dictator or a city mayor or a, ca a count or something. But he, um, he did things like banning jewelry. And the jewelers who were in Geneva at the time, they were like, okay, what's, what do we do next? And they, a lot of them moved to watch me. And this is in the uh, 1500s. Uh, this era is a marker. Yes. Yeah, so this is like the, this is about the 1500s. Uh, fast forward a little bit, and we stumble across the 1800s. And this is kind of when, um, before, in the in this time period before the 1800s, Swiss watch making was like, I don't want to say second tier, but it wasn't like, whoa, Swiss watch making. You know what I mean? It was. Uh, you had the French making a lot of good watches, you had the British making good watches, you had the Germans making good watches. Um, the Swiss were, um, I would say, minor players in the watch game. Or maybe, if not, maybe not minor, but you know, they were not, didn't have hegemony. Yes. I, I, I wrote here that they were second tier class, second tier watch nation, but yeah, I don't really know. But they had a secret weapon, weapon and it was called Esta Lesage. And this was a rapid development cycle, which in, evolves around different, manu, different manufacturers creating different pieces, then having them centrally assembled. So basically, um, industrialization. Um, let's say, for example, you had one company could manufacture the dial. This company would manufacture this part, and this company would manufacture this part, and they would all get centrally. Um, Assembled, you know, much like how uh, uh, things are. I don't want to say things are really like that today. The Swiss made a transition into more in house later, but we'll get into that. Um, for example, if you look at. So I'll give you an example of Embassage, or whatever it's called. Um, I, let's say I order a part from China, a case from China, I got a movement from Japan, 
I got a dial from Germany, and I got, you know, this from that. You know, imagine that, but you got this from this company, that from this company, this from this company, that from this company. And then, finally, you know, put it all together to make a watch. And uh, this would actually hurt them later down the road. Um, kind of, because they kind of went in-house, but they still had that kind of fractured uh, development cycle from different in-house companies buying parts from other people. And um, this would hurt them later on uh, when Quartz comes out. But in the eight, in 1800, the Swiss and British both produced around 200,000 timepieces. In 1850, the British were still producing around 200,000 pieces, but in 1850, the Swiss produced 2.8 million timepieces. So, I wrote down here that the Swiss were kind of like the J Japan of today, and that was due to that establishage um, technique or whatever manufacturing whatever. So there were a huge volume put at, at competitive prices and there were slightly lower quality. So that's why I said that they were like Japan. Um, I'll repeat that again. Huge volume of wristwatches, competitive prices, and slightly lower quality. And no matter what, though, they could not break into the American market. The Americans viewed the Swiss, Swiss watches as garbage. They didn't like them. And it was a huge untapped market, and uh, you know the Swiss wanted to break in, and uh, they did eventually. So don't get me wrong; some Swiss companies were putting out some quality wristwatches. However, they were utterly outproduced by the cheaper Swiss brands. The Americans associated Swiss with low quality, and they needed a way to keep costs low and increase quality. So just the, the classic problem. How can I make things cheaper? How can I make things better, right? Especially from a consumer point of view. You want, you'd have everything for nothing if you could. But then they figured out, okay, automation. This is, I'm talking factories, I'm talking machine tools, I'm talking um, mostly just that. But you know, this is 1850 guys. This is the industrial revolution is in full swing. And um, watch, <laughs> interesting how this happened, happened again recent, more recently. But the watch manufacturing was like, they were they were hesitant to start incorporating machines into their uh, work routines. So this guy named Ingold and Le Clo Le, Le, Clo Le Clo sorry I don't I can't even read my own handwriting sometimes led the way. They were selling machine parts in Switzerland. They found so they, and they found success in Switzerland. When they went to the British, the British were like, "No, we don't want your stuff." But when they got to America, the Americans were like. Yes, please. We love this. Go sell us some of your machine tools, and then that kind of helped start the um, the late 18th, the late 19th century American watch boom. And so the Swiss continued on their path of, ex of watch making. Uh, one thing that doesn't really get talked too much about, and to help you kind of give you some insight on why the Swiss continue to have such a good watch industry was because they were they had a very 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 stable economy I'm looking at myself why am I not looking at you guys they had a very stable economy they, they stayed out of World War one they stayed out of World War two and remember like just look at what happened to Germany in World War two their industry was completely wiped out they had to start from scratch France had to start from scratch you know what I mean World, the world wars really just crippled so many countries in Switzerland they didn't have their infrastructure harmed they were exporting watches to the warring powers they were never uh, once again they were not invaded they never did any invading uh, this Switzerland is very very mountainous and there's like mountain passes and especially back in the day it was hard to get in to, to get into Switzerland so what they in World War two that what they did was they had bombs everywhere right? under all the bridges, under all the roads, then in case the Germans came knocking on their door saying, hey, we want in, well, now what? It's gonna take you three months to get to freaking, uh, what's the capital of Switzerland? I don't even know. Oh, my family is to sing happy birthday to someone, I don't even, it's Sunday to anyone's birthday. But, um, yeah, so this world, staying neutral during the World Wars really helped the Swiss watch industry. Uh, remember in World War One, they were selling watches to the Germans, the French, the British, and World War Two, 
they were selling watches to the Germans. Um, so, you know, and also also the Swiss banking. Swiss banking kind of helped them stay neutral because, you know, countries would put their money in Switzerland and I don't know about you, but yeah, you don't want to have your gold get blown up or robbed by another country. So it was kind of like, okay, okay, the Swiss, you kind of leave them alone. But by extension by that, it left alone the Swiss watch industry. And while people in Britain and blah blah blah, and blah, blah and especially Germany and France, specifically them, yeah, they had to restart multiple times. The, the Swiss were, were really good. And then if you're gonna go to really where the Swiss, where we, we, what we think about, you know, the classic Swiss watch industry, what is that, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. But remember, in, the, in 1950, Germany was still completely rebuilding after World War II, and it was split between two countries, right? You had the West, you had the East Germany. You know, and I, but the Swiss watch industry was just intact, you know, so I don't think that, I think the Swiss watch industry would be completely obliterated, would have been completely obliterated if they had, they had been invaded during one of those wars. So enough about that. Uh, if you're more interested in, in this, go type in Swiss history, type in Swiss watch making history. Really simple searches on Google. Look them up. Check it out. Um, thank you very, very much for watching. It's glad. It's fun to be back, learning about horology, sharing it with you guys, and Akuma out.